Welcome to this week's Sight for White talking news for Friday the 16th of April 2021. Sight for White sent our sincere condolences this week to Her Majesty the Queen following the death of His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh. We are all thinking of her and her family at this difficult time. Alison reading an article from the Isle of Wight radio entitled Isle of Wight Council to receive £6.3 million to improve Camp Hill Estate. The Isle of Wight Council will be given £6.3 million to improve the area of the Camp Hill prison estate in Newport. The Isle of Wight Council and Ministry of Justice, MOJ, have reached agreement on a deal which will allow the council to improve the roads, open spaces and footways in current MOJ ownership on the former prison estate. As part of the agreement, the council will receive a one-off fee of £6.3 million from the government to upgrade and maintain the area to a good standard for the foreseeable future. As previously reported, the council will take over the ownership of the land from the MOJ. It is expected that the works might take up to two years to complete and the council will communicate with residents as plans for the works are confirmed. As the deal has just been agreed, residents are asked to be patient until the council has had time to work through these plans. Speaking previously, Chris Ashman, the Council's Director of Regeneration, said The highways and footways are in a poor state of repair and local residents have been concerned to see improvements made for some considerable time. The Council, as Highways Authority, is better placed to oversee the repairs and future maintenance and as part of the transaction, the Ministry of Justice will make a financial contribution towards the costs. As part of our regeneration programme, we will work closely with local residents to prioritise the works to be undertaken and achieve the best possible outcome using the funds available to improve community cohesion and quality of life. Residents can contact the council via a dedicated email address. Parkhurst Enquiries at iow.gov.uk and both Parkhurst and Enquiries have a capital letter to begin them. This is Den reading an article from Isle of Wight Radio. Rising demand sees social distancing changes at hover travel. Still no sign of fast cat. An uplift in demand has led to hover travel changing its social distancing measures onboard flights. But there is still no sign of Whitelink bringing its ride to Portsmouth Fastcat back into service to help meet the increasing footfall. Hover Travel has been allowing Whitelink passengers to travel on its hovercrafts as part of a ticket agreement during the pandemic. Now with social restrictions easing and no Fastcat return in sight, the firm has had to adjust its health and safety protocols to mitigate the risks that come with with the rising demand. Hover travel says ensuring a continuous flow of passengers on its crafts is safer than having a lower capacity on board and allowing a build-up of people in and around terminals. The assessment was carried out following the publication of the government's roadmap and took into account the following. The current level of infection, the take-up of vaccines, the downgrade of the NHS emergency alert level, the customer behaviour at the end of the last two lockdowns, the risks associated with their complete journey from arrival to leaving our premises. A spokesperson for Hovel Travel said, Our passengers and our staff's safety are our number one priority, and even before the pandemic, we had a safety first culture. We have operated through the national emergency, throughout all three lockdowns and during the tears period, each time taking the steps necessary to mitigate the risks. 
our dynamic approach to the constantly changing external conditions has been communicated to our customers clearly and with empathy. However, the firm says it will try to make arrangements should passengers want to travel on a less busy flight. A spokesperson added, We understand and appreciate that customers, whether they be travelling with us for the first time in a year or our regular commuters, may be cautious about the changes the roadmap is bringing. We are listening to our customers and over 99.9 .9 are happy with the approach we are taking. We urge any customers that if they feel uncomfortable at any stage of the journey, to ask to speak to a team leader or duty manager. If they wish to travel on a less busy flight, they will be able to help. Whitelink has repeatedly told Isle of Wight Radio that demand doesn't yet warrant the return of its fast cat service. Asked whether rising footfall on hover travel will fall, would force its hand, the ferry firm did not wish to comment. Whitelink says there is still no return date for its fast cat. This is an article from the Island Echo, read by Terry. Health bosses' concerns about pandemic's effect on cancer services. Healthcare bosses on the Isle of Wight are worried about the effect COVID-19 has had on cancer performance of the island's only hospital. During the pandemic, cancer services continued to run, but in an update given to the Isle of Wight NHS Trusts Board, it was said a considerable number of people had either deferred or declined appointments and treatment at mainland hospitals. Chief Operating Officer of the Trust, Joe Smith, said he was particularly concerned about the risks caused by waiting times that had built up. He said, We have been able to get most of the people to their appointments, but I have concerns some people will have inadvertently been caused harm by delaying their own treatment. Plans have been put in place to ensure people are not missing out, improve the services and recover from the COVID pandemic with help from other health bodies such as Wessex Cancer Alliance and Portsmouth Hospitals University NHS Trust. An offer for patients to have their cancer surgery in Portsmouth, however, was turned down by a third of patients after discussing it with their surgeon, preferring to have their treatments on the island instead. It is something that has been seen in other areas of medicine on the island, with 65% of patients that were offered it turning down the private operations on the mainland. People not accessing their care was also an issue raised by the Trust's Quality and Performance Committee, which said patient choice seemed to be a significant barrier to achieving pathway times and access to care. The breast screening programme at St Mary's Hospital Newport has fully recovered, meaning there is no backlog of people waiting for their routine three yearly checks. Another area where the trust is above its target is in the 31-day wait from diagnosis to patients' first treatment. 97% of patients in February were seen within the time frame, with 100% in January. Hello, this is Sue reading an article from the Isle of Wight County Press. Red jet timetable increased as services expand following lockdown. Red Funnel has announced a successful first day of its expanded red jet timetable and reinstatement of the Key Connect bus service which resumed on Monday following the easing of government restrictions. The return to through day coverage was well received by local passengers, many of whom were travelling from the Isle of Wight to Southampton for day trips. In addition, the Blue Star operated Key Connect bus service has resumed taking passengers into the heart of Southampton from the Red Jet Terminal at Town Quay, free of additional charge to all Red Funnel passengers. 
Key Connect's return to service follows a suspension of nearly 12 months due to the onset of the pandemic. Popular reasons for islanders to venture into Southampton on Monday included shopping trips in line with the reopening of non-essential retail, with popular destinations including West Quay, Shopping Centre, Primark and Ikea. Another common reason for travel included hospital appointments with a midday availability of the Red Jet, improving convenience. Fran Collins, chief executive of Red Funnel, said it's fantastic to return our Red Jet service to a more frequent schedule in line with the easing of government's restrictions. We continue to closely monitor customer demand for our services and will ensure we're taking the right actions at the right time when it comes to further expansion of our timetables in the weeks and months to come. As has been the case since the onset of the pandemic, all decisions we take will be carefully risk assessed. The safety of our customers and colleagues will continue to be our top priority. Alison reading an article from the Isle of Wight County Press entitled The Businesses Not Opening As We Emerge From Covid Lockdown. As the island emerges from lockdown after an extraordinary year, evidence of a tough 12 months can be seen in the high streets and town centres. Non-essential shops can reopen from Monday and pub gardens will once again welcome thirsty customers. But, sadly, there are some gaping holes left by the businesses that didn't make it. Those who haven't ventured into Newport for a while will be in for a shock at the dozens of empty premises. In October we reported more than 40 empty retail premises and that figure has since got worse. One of the biggest losses was the central co-op on Pyle Street and South Street and along with it the town's main post office. It closed in early February and there is still no post office in the centre of the island's county town. The site of the former long-serving High Street post office was taken over a few years ago by restaurant chain Prezzo, which also closed during the pandemic. The iconic building is currently unoccupied. The loss of Prezzo came after the closure of Pizza Express, occupying a big chunk of the corner on Town Lane and Pyle Street. This site also remains empty. One of the first casualties was Laura Ashley, which blamed coronavirus when it closed as the pandemic began. The firm said the virus outbreak has had an immediate and significant impact on trading. It had been in talks with its lenders about accessing sufficient money to allow it to continue trading, but then said it would not get those funds in time. The huge ATS Euromaster site on South Street didn't open after the first lockdown in 2020 and is now on the market. Another casualty was Topshop, which finally succumbed after months of financial difficulties. The local team bid goodbye to customers with a note on the door at the St James Street branch. Up the high street, clothing store Animal closed in September after a closing down sale. A favourite of young girls, accessory shop Claire's suddenly closed in December. Staff put a note in the window, bidding goodbye and thanking customers for their support. Independent clothing store Mia has now closed in Newport, although retains its shops in Cows and Ride. Adding to the misery for shoppers, parking charges went up on October the 15th. The Isle of Wight Council said at the time, the changes are designed to make parking charges fairer and simpler across the island, ahead of a detailed review of parking facilities and fees. Mindful of the impact of coronavirus, the Council has held back from implementing the adjustments for as long as possible, at considerable cost to its budget position. The Conservative Party announced what it hopes to do for Newport in the future, to regenerate the town including a riverside quarter of new homes and potentially knocking down County Hall. Oldest Island Charity receives lottery funding for Friends, Tech and Alexa from Isle of Wight County Press, 
read by Chris. Sight for White, Isle of Wight Society for the Blind, the oldest working Isle of Wight charity, has been awarded National Lottery Community Funding to set up fantastic services to help people living with and affected by sight loss on the island. Here is what we've achieved with this generous funding. A friend in need. At the heart of this lottery funded project is the Sight for White telephone befriending service which has been set up to provide weekly calls to visually impaired people across the island. This service provides regular social contact from a friendly volunteer, whether that is to help with something specific or for just a chat. The uptake on the service has exceeded all expectations and, in fact, we now need more volunteers who are good, empathetic listeners and can spare just one hour a week. If you think you can help, please contact Elaine. Hello everyone, Audible QR Codes. This part of the funding has been used to continue to promote the Sight for White Hello Everyone QR Codes. Lisa Hollyhead, CEO, herself registered blind since birth, created these codes last year after entering the charity's dress agency, Dress for Less. Due to COVID secure measures, the layout was entirely different with the essential notices around the shop. Entering the shop, Lisa in fact tripped over the hand sanitizing table and knew she did not have enough sight to read the posters. She thought, if only the notices could talk and someone could tell me how to enter the shop safely. The Sight for White Hello Everyone Audible QR codes were born. Now the codes are being rolled out across the island with key companies such as Hover Travel and public bodies including Hampshire Police adopting them. If you would like further information, please contact Lisa. And last but not least, our Alexa skill. For 50 years, every single week, the Talking News reads out the printed local news, including the county press, and has been run entirely by a team of 30 volunteers, led by Terry Mitchell. During lockdown, for the first time, production ceased when access to the recording studio was halted. However, Vectis Radio stepped in and broadcast it instead. Here at Sight for White, we took the opportunity to think again on how better to send out this recording. The result? The Alexa and Google skill. The skill has been written to work alongside the USBs, as Sight for White understands all members have their own preferences. The new skill, however, will offer so much more as it can be updated in seconds on a daily basis. Lisa said, The funding also provides camera-enabled Alexa devices to be offered to our members on loan. This means they can use the camera for the What is This skill, which reads labels on any food or other items, allowing visually impaired people to continue to live as independently as they wish. Please call. 01983 or email enquiries at iwsb.org.uk for further information. This is Den reading an article from the Isle of Wight radio. Isle of Wight scam warnings revealed, including a worrying one regarding the census. Scams including one regarding the census, have started doing the rounds on the Isle of Wight. Trading Standards says it has also received reports of phone calls and texts being sent to islanders claiming to be from home insulation companies and national insurance. Home insulation calls. There are said to be a number of calls from companies around home insulation. The caller will tell you they will visit and check out your home insulation in the roof and then offer you a one-time only deal for providing insulation. Similarly, calls about asbestos in your property. They will arrange to call and check your property for asbestos and will almost certainly find some. They will, they will then overcharge you for the removal and disposal of the non-existent asbestos. 
We are being warned to not engage with anyone who calls you out of the blue. And remember, any work that these companies are likely to do will be overpriced and of poor quality. National insurance scams. Another common phone scam at the moment appears to come from national insurance, stating that your national insurance company has been compromised or suspended. This is a scam, so hang up. The census scam. There have also been worrying reports that a scam text regarding the census has started doing the rounds. It says there appears to be incorrect on your completed census form. To avoid a £100 fine, please click on the link they provide. This is a scam. The ONS states message. You will never be issued with a fine by text message on social media or by email. Our cyber intelligence team is scouring the web for phishing sites and taking them down. If you find a site that looks suspicious or receive text messages with links to sites asking for money related to the census, do not engage with them. Report them to the Census 2021 Contact Centre by ringing 0800 Scam texts can be forwarded to 7726 and scam emails sent on to report at phishing.gov.uk. Hello, this is Sue reading an article from On the White. New strategy to improve Isle of Wight ambulance service announced. New ways of working have been announced for the country's smallest ambulance service. A new five-year strategy to improve the Isle of Wight NHS Trust's ambulance service has been introduced. Presented at a meeting of the Trust Board last week, the new strategy will see the island's current partnership with South Central Ambulance Services, SCAS, involving to provide the best appropriate response for islanders. Nikki Turner, the Trust Director of Transformation, said principles, work programmes and the Trust visions have all been aligned to explore new roles and ways of working. A key part of the strategy is a different approach to responding to calls, so that non-emergency calls can be dealt with through other emergency care pathways if appropriate. This will free up the island's limited ambulance resources and ensure patients get the right treatment with the most relevant specialist in the right place. Mark Ainsworth, SCAS Director of Operations, said on the mainland they have found they were sending fewer ambulance out to call but were getting positive feedback from patients. For example, if a patient falls at home, it might be better to send a physiotherapist instead of an ambulance crew. It is something that the Isle of Wight NHS Trust has been working on throughout the rollout of their Think 111 First campaign, where an ambulance may not be the answer to what people call for. Joe Smythe, Trust Chief Operating Officer, said, through the 111 initiative, the number of patients being booked into the emergency treatment centre at St Mary's had increased tenfold since the start of the coronavirus pandemic with about 700 patients now coming in having spoken to 111. Mr Smy said there would always be more resources required on the island for the ambulance service, which is the smallest in the country, and said at night it only takes two people to fall ill for a third of the ambulance fleet to be out of action. Another challenge faced by the ambulance service is the geography it covers, which at times has led to longer response times. To offset the issue, the new strategy would to connect callers either via phone or digitally when appropriate, so the need to travel was reduced. Overall, he said, the strategy's vision is for high quality, compassionate care that makes us a positive difference to our island community. This is an article from the Island Echo, read by Terry. Osborne House to pilot new technology to cut running costs. A first-of-its-kind scheme to pilot sensors to monitor and manage building services at Osborne House, the former holiday home of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, will start following a successful trial at Kenworth House. 
Dozens of tiny sensors are to be installed inside the house to discreetly monitor environmental changes within the building. The technology learns what normal looks like for the building over a short period. The pilot is part of Ecclesiastical's Loss Prevention Innovation Programme and is helping English Heritage to reduce costs. English Heritage's annual budget for maintaining its buildings is around £15 million. The pilot is assisting the charity's objective to achieve a 25% reduction in operating costs. The sensors, which are unobtrusive, battery-operated and do not require Wi-Fi, are deployed across the estate and send live, real-time data back to be analysed, enabling English Heritage to identify performance issues in its mechanical and electrical plant or catch minor leaks before they cause major problems. The technology, which was first trialled at Kenwood House throughout the pandemic, identifies key areas where cost savings and efficiencies can be made, as well as how to optimise its building services during the national lockdowns. Ecclesiastical, English Heritage and technology firm Shepherd are collaborating with the UCL Institute for Sustainable Heritage to give Data Science for Cultural Heritage Master of Science students access to data and insights from the pilot. Faith Kitchen, Heritage Director at Ecclesiastical Insurance, said... As the UK's leading insurer of Grade 1 listed buildings, we are passionate about protecting Britain's heritage. As part of our innovation programme, we are delighted to be partnering with English Heritage and Shepherd to expand our cutting-edge technology pilot. We know that rising energy costs are a major concern and incidents such as electrical fire or escape of water can be disastrous for customers, which is why we are piloting innovative solutions to detect issues as early as possible. Rob Woodside, Conservation and Estates Director at English Heritage, said... The application of live, real-time monitoring has huge potential to revolutionise the management of heritage estates in a sustainable way. This pilot will enable us to minimise risks to the building and its irreplaceable collections by cost-effective, evidence-based, preventive maintenance. We are now equipped with real-time insight and a risk score which enables us to make smarter, more informed decisions around how we manage the performance and risk of stately homes and historic buildings, both day-to-day and strategically. This insight is not a nice-to-have but absolutely essential for us to both better protect the building, its contents and revenue. Stephen Chadwick, CEO at Shepherd, said, We are delighted to be supporting ecclesiastical and English heritage as they transform the way they manage risk. Shepherd's real-time 24-7 monitoring and alerts Preempt and prevent damage, breakdowns and emergencies. Our risk analysis enables a consolidated overview of the performance of the property to support keeping Osborne House and its contents safe for many years to come. Alison, reading an article from the Isle of Wight County Press, entitled Heron Makes Surprise Visit to Isle of Wight Home. Sometimes we worry about putting a spider outside. 
But at other times, as one islander found this week, the problem can be a little bigger. There is definitely no glass large enough to put over a three feet tall heron. A ride resident was shocked to discover the huge bird in her kitchen. She described the moment as being like having a dinosaur in her home. She managed to capture the moment on her camera and shared the video with the Isle of Wight County Press as the bird dropped in for a visit from a nearby pond. Keeping calm, she gently ushered it out the door and spoke to the heron saying, Hey, could you leave please? Out you go, you can do it. We think she deserves an award for her measured response. This is Den reading an article from the Isle of Wight Radio. Destructive vandalism of environmental charity site in Ryde. An environmental charity's site in Ryde has been deliberately vandalised. Environmental charity Gift to Nature found large patches of damage to the Pig Leg Lane site on Saturday morning. It is a local nature reserve that has had considerable resources directed to it over the last few years. A lot of household items were found strewn across the site, including chairs and a wheelbarrow, but more worrying were the many sections of turf methodically dug from the landscape, plus evidence of more than one bonfire. Islanders have reported a lot of noisy activity recently and on one occasion called the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Service over fears that bonfires might get out of control. Graham Biss, managing director of the charity, said It is always frustrating to come across damage to any of our sites, but sadly it is part and parcel of the ranger's weekly work. However, we don't usually see such destructive vandalism. We are grateful to the local residents for valuing our sites and alerting us to any problems. Community groups like Respect Ride are our daily eyes and ears on the ground and rest assured the damage and unwanted household debris will be removed. We will not be deterred from continuing to improve the sites we manage. In direct contrast, we have had hundreds of families visiting the new Willow Maze at Golden Hill Country Park and we hope to be able to bring something equally as exciting to one of the ride's outdoor spaces in the near future. Alison reading an article from the Isle of Wight County Press entitled He Enjoyed Coming Here Princess Royal Speaks of Duke of Edinburgh in Cows the Princess Royal reminisced about sailing in her younger years as she made her first in-person appearance at an official event since her father's death. Her Royal Highness appeared in good spirits as she met with members of the Royal Yacht Squadron in Cowes on Wednesday, the prestigious club the Duke of Edinburgh was once Admiral of. The Princess, who's 70, said she could understand why Philip visited the Cowes-based club adding that he enjoyed coming down here. Asked by Royal Yacht Squadron Commodore Jamie Sheldon if she had ever sailed on a Flying 15, a sailboat designed by Offa Fox, Anne said, I was considered a bit too young and a bit of a nuisance. I started really with Bloodhound, a yacht. I regressed to dinghy sailing for a bit, but then got a slightly bigger boat. Of course, many RYA, that's the Royal Yachting Association, meetings used to be on Britannia during Cow's Week. Anne, the only daughter of the Queen and the Duke, wore sunglasses, a navy blue jacket, black trousers, shoes, gloves and a black bag for the visit. She smiled as she spoke with senior members of the club and young aspiring sailors. The princess left the club on a motor yacht called Warrior around midday before arriving at Royal Victoria Yacht Club in Fishbourne. There she unveiled a plaque marking the club's 175th anniversary and signed its guest book as her parents had done on July 26, 1965. Her visit comes ahead of the Duke's funeral this Saturday at Windsor Castle. 
Prince Philip, who died aged 99 on Friday, was Admiral of the Royal Yacht Squadron, patron of a number of clubs and President of the Royal Yachting Association. It was announced at the weekend the monarchy and their households would observe two weeks of royal mourning, with members of the royal family continuing to undertake engagements appropriate to the circumstances, a royal official said. This is an article from On the White, read by Terry. Aggregate dredging off Sandown Bay is not impacting on coastline, says MP. The Isle of Wight Conservative MP Bob Seeley has received assurances from the Crown Estate, responsible for granting dredging licences, that marine aggregate dredging activity off Sandown Bay is not impacting on the coastline. Responding to a letter from the MP last month, the Crown Estate said there was evidence to show that the aggregate deposits on the seabed were relict deposits of sand and gravel left by ancient rivers, and as such were immobile, meaning their extraction would not cause significant changes to the coastline. Mr Seeley was also advised that the dredging activity was fully licensed with regular monitoring surveys undertaken in accordance with Marine Management Organisation, that's MMO, requirements. In a letter to the island's MP, the Crown Estate said, We take our environmental and stewardship responsibilities very seriously and we continue to work with the British Marine Aggregate Producers Association and the Aggregates Industry to help support the effective and sustainable management of our seabed, helping to drive a significant long-term reduction in the total area of seabed licensed for marine aggregate extraction. Furthermore, Mr Seeley was provided with a report published in 2019 by the Southern Coastal Group which concluded that erosion in the Bay Area in the years leading up to the report was largely due to record-breaking major storm events and higher mean sea levels. Mr Seeley said, I know that residents are concerned about the dredging currently taking place off Sandown Bay. It concerned me too. However, the evidence I have seen suggests that the marine aggregate dredging is not impacting on the shoreline and that erosion in the area is largely the result of historic storm activity from previous years. I am satisfied that this is a well-regulated industry with regular monitoring in place and I thank the Crown Estate for taking the time to talk to me. No One Home From the Isle of Wight County Press Read by Chris More than 3,000 properties sitting empty on island The island has one of the highest rates of empty houses in England, including more than 3,000 second homes. One in 20 homes on the island are out of use, either as empty or second homes. Campaigners, Action on Empty Homes, analysed Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, MHCLG, figures and found 3,564 homes on the Isle of Wight were not being used as of October, although this is down from 3,726 the year before. Of these, 510 were long-term vacancies, unoccupied for at least six months, and 3,054 were second homes. Separate figures from MHCLG show there were 186 households on the Isle of Wight in temporary accommodation as of September, including 238 children. A further 802 vacant homes had been used within the last six months. An MHCLG spokesman said, 
we have given councils powers and strong incentives to tackle empty homes, including the power to increase council tax by up to 300% on these properties and take over the management of homes that have been empty for a long period. They also received the same new homes bonus for bringing an empty home back into use as for building a new one. The Isle of Wight Council said, we take the issue of empty homes seriously. In 2019, an empty property strategy was adopted, which aims to bring long-term empty properties back into use to increase the supply of quality and affordable homes for island residents and reduce the impact of empty properties on local communities. Empty homes and second homes are not the same thing, nor is this directly connected to families in temporary accommodation. The Isle of Wight Council defines long-term empty homes as homes empty for two years or more, of which there are 131. They say there has been a steady decline in numbers over the last two years, many as a result of intervention by the council. They said the majority of the 510 properties recorded as empty for six months do not need intervention and are reoccupied under normal conditions. It also said the island is better than the national average, going by data provided by the Empty Homes Network, which ranked the Isle of Wight as 55 out of 328 councils. Island MP Bob Seeley said, I support the council using its compulsory purchase powers more, and if need be, getting more powers to ensure houses are used. The council is looking at brownfield sites for the construction of new homes, and there may also be opportunities to convert existing properties in our town centres into affordable accommodation. I know the council works hard to pull empty properties back into use. Richard Quigley of Ireland Labour said, the right to secure housing should be a basic human right. The figures on the amount of second homes here don't do anything to make that aim a reality for hard-working families who can't afford a first home. The problem is, there is nothing to stop people with enough money buying as many homes as they like. Houses that are left empty do very little for the communities they are based in. It could be argued they actually diminish an area. Another problem is even if all these empty properties were suddenly available to buy or rent, they would be out of reach of the average island resident. The average house price here is 9.5 times the average island income. Average rent takes up 32% of the average islander's pre-tax income. So the real problem is the lack of truly affordable housing and council-built and owned homes. We should be building council houses at affordable rents. It would also mean they have emergency accommodation available for the 186 families that require it. Here's a letter from the letters to the editor from the County Press. Much demanded from Ian Pratt Ride. It is essential for local democracy that council officers' salaries are in the public domain, particularly as we, the council taxpayers, are paying for those salaries. However, there is a danger that seeing the large amounts paid, which are beyond the wildest dreams of most, will engender dissatisfaction with one's own lot. Council staff need to be held to account by us, especially those at the top end of the salary scale, because from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. Luke 12 verse 48. This is Chris, Marketing and Events Coordinator, welcoming you to this week's Talking News and to inform you that Lisa, our CEO, is taking a well-earned break this week, so her usual update will resume from next week. Thank you. Skips News, week commencing Monday 19th of April 2021. Yarmouth area, On the Rocks, Bridge Road. Sea View area, Pear Tree Cottage Circular Road. Newport area, 97 Gunville Road, Gunville. Sandown area, 37 Perone Way. Shanklin area, 
23 Hungerberry Close. Scaffolding. Ride area. 51 George Street. 1B Cross Street. 183 High Street. Ride Bakery, 50 Union Street. Newport area. Guildhall High Street. 2 to 8 Carisbrook Road. Halifax High Street. Sandown area. Trouville Hotel Sandown Esplanade. Flat C St George's Hall. Cowes area. 31 Mill Hill Road. 72 High Street. Toby's of Cowes, 9 High Street. Yarmouth area. Grove Cottage, St James's Street. Shanklin area. 77 Regent Street. Seaview area. Willow, West Street. Site for White would like to thank you for listening to this week's edition of the Talking News. We would also like to thank our volunteers for reading and a particular thank you to the Isle of Wight County Press, On the White, Island Echo, Isle of Wight Radio and a special thank you to Vectis Radio.